Okay, that's not right at the start, but that'll do. So as Matt mentioned, my name's Andrew Spencer. I'm the CEO of Australian Pork Limited. Uh, this afternoon, I want to go through with you some of the things that the Australian pork industry is doing, particularly in the area of more strongly engaging with our consumers and the broader community. But first, a little bit of context. Pork's the most widely consumed meat in the world. It's something over 110 million tonnes per annum consumed and produced in different parts of the world. <clears throat> Here in Australia, we only produce around 0.3 of 1% of all of that pork. So that means around about 1 three hundredths of the world's pork is produced in Australia. An average Australian consumes about 25 kilograms of pork each year, and that's in two formats. The first one being small goods, which is mainly ham and bacon, and the second one being fresh pork. And that 25 kilos has been growing over the years, as you can see in this graph, which shows the annual per capita consumption of four of our major sources of protein. And as you can also see, chicken's been the big winner, and you heard that a bit from Trish as well. It's been the big winner in terms of growth since the 1960s. And you also heard from Trish that a lot of the reason for that has been the reducing relative price of chicken over time. And there's many of the dynamics shown in this graph which can be put down to relative price differences, but also a changing food culture over time with the Australian consumer. In Australia, we produce domestically around about 4.8 million pigs per annum, and about 90% of that is consumed right here. The rest is exported. You can see the pink line there represents the moving annual total slaughter numbers for pigs in Australia, and you can see a huge dive back in 2008-2009. Uh, we had a perfect storm of profitability crisis at that time, which was due to very high costs. And you might remember grain prices went through the roof back in 2008. Grain is the single biggest input to pig production, um, combined with low pig prices. That was really driven by a huge increase in imports that came into Australia at that time. So we started in 2007 with a, a slaughter number of around about 5.4 million per annum. That dived down to 4.5 million. We lost 15% of production. We lost about 300 of our pig producers. And we have been slowly building from that number uh, back up to 4.8 million where we sit today. And that seems to be growing at a very slow rate. And I think that's consistent with some of the figures you saw from Trish also. On top of that domestic production, however, and different to many other agricultural commodities, we are one of the few agricultural commodities in Australia where we can meet, compete domestically with imported product. And this graph shows the, the trend of import volume growth since the mid-90s, and you can see it's just been absolutely enormous. So today we're importing some 150,000 tonnes of pig meat every year, uh, all of that is converted into small goods, again, mainly ham and bacon. And the reason is our biosecurity protocols mean that every kilogram of meat, pig meat imported into Australia has to be cooked for a certain time and at a certain temperature. And that limits the markets that that pork can then enter. So if you, uh, you do the sums, you can work out that actually nearly half of all the pork consumed in Australia is coming from pigs grown on the other side of the world. Europe and North America is where this product's coming from. And if you do the sums a bit more, that means that about 70% of all the bacon and ham consumed in Australia is made from imported pork. And that fact is not known very widely by many of our Australian consumers. So despite the relatively small role that the Australian pork industry plays in the global context, at least from a, a production volume point of view, we are a world leader in many of the things our industry is doing and achieving. Being a relatively small global player, recognising that our farm business environment is unlikely to ever allow us to be world's lowest cost pork producers, we recognise the importance of building quality attributes into our brand to make the Australian pork different and we look to engage our consumers in promoting those differences and those attributes. For example, we know that our consumers want to be assured of the quality and the safety of our product. 
they want to know that it's tracked through the supply chain and if we have to, we can trace it back to, to the farm that it was originally from. And they want to know that it's been produced in a way that respects ethical values, values such as the protection of the environment and values such as the protection of our animals and the, the good welfare of our animals. And a good example of this has been our shifts in the use of something called sow stalls in Australia. A sow stall or a gestation stall is an individual confining pen in which sows have traditionally spent a large part of their pregnancy, the majority of their pregnancy. And the photo here on the left shows uh, rows of sow stalls. They, they were originally introduced back in the 60s and 70s, and they, at, the, at that time, were a great contributor to the welfare of the sow because they enabled pig farmers to do a couple of things. Firstly, they enabled pig farmers to manage the individual needs of sows because they are individually confined. And secondly, they enabled pig farmers to manage the aggression uh, that is very um, common among sows during pregnancy. But it was clear to us when we showed consumers how we were raising their pork and we showed them these types of production systems they didn't actually like them. And they made it clear to us that they preferred that the sows would have room to move, room to move around, and room to socialise with each other. And that was a catalyst to us back in probably the 1990s, when our industry started to invest what has become millions of dollars into research and development, into ways of managing pregnant sows in groups, not in individual confinement, but in groups, and in doing that, not compromising on their individual welfare. So the alternative to sow stalls is what we call loose housing or group housing, uh, where the animals are in larger groups, able to move about, they're able to socialise, and that's shown in the photograph here on the right. And today, as a result of all of those millions of dollars of research and development that we've spent, uh, we in Australia are a world leader in the science and the understanding of the management of sows in these grouped systems. And again, that research and development investment enabled us at our annual general meeting for Australian Pork Limited in 2010 to put forward a resolution to our delegates at that meeting where we suggested that the industry pursue a voluntary phase out of the use of sow stalls to be achieved by 2017. <coughs> and that resolution was overwhelmingly uh, voted in, in favour of at a level of around about 90%. And the result of that means that we are now adopting group, group housing systems across the, our industry on a voluntary basis, replacing the use of sow stalls. And today, this remains a world first initiative. No other country uh, in the world, their pork industry has matched it. I should make it clear though, that ceasing the use of sow stalls or gestation stalls during pregnancy does not mean there is no confinement of sows individually at all. We have a definition that was provided with that resolution around what it means to phase out sow stalls. And that definition basically said that the sows have to be loose housed or group housed for the major part of the pregnancy. And it's from two specific points. It's from a maximum of five days after mating. So in those five days, the sow can be in a mating stall. It's not a sow stall, but it is a confinement. Up until one week before farrowing. And at that time, the sow can go into what's called a farrowing crate where the, the piglets are born. So for the vast majority of the pregnancy, the sows have to be loose housed. Uh, and that turns out to be around about 90%. So a maximum of 10% individual confinement is what is built into the industry's definition of sow stall free or gestation stall free. So if we look at how this places us in comparison to our import competition from Europe and North America, we can see just how far out in front of them we are in moving away from sour pregnancy confinement. And in Europe, with the ex exception of the UK and Netherlands, where they have regulated bans on sour stalls, uh, in the Netherlands case, similar to the industry um, voluntary initiative here, but for the rest of Europe, they have restricted the use of sow stalls to a maximum of four weeks of any pregnancy. And that rule or regulation has been in place since the start of 2013, last year. But even the EU admit that their levels of compliance are still very poor. And those compliance problems exist across many EU countries, including some very large countries, 
like France and like Spain. So if you work that out, it means that according to the law, they can confine their sows individually for at least 30% of the pregnancy, but many of them aren't actually obeying the law. So the average term is likely more than that. Looking then to North America, sow stalls remain the de default housing choice for pregnant sows. So standard practice, total pregnancy, 100% individual confinement. So, and I just want to remind you, these are the countries that supply around 70% of the pork for the ham and bacon we consume here in Australia. But I can hear you saying the Australian pork industry has made a commitment to phase out sow stalls, but it hasn't been done yet, and that's, that's actually quite true. But we have been very diligently tracking the progress of how the industry is going in this phase out, and this is shown here in the chart. On the horizontal axis on the bottom, that represents the period of a sow's pregnancy, which is about 115 days or up to 16 weeks. The vertical uh, axis represents the proportion of our industry's sows. We survey our producers and the results makes up what you can see here. The green area is the proportion of sows in our industry that are uh, at the various points of uh, their pregnancy group housed or loose housed. And the two different types of pink areas are the sows that are still in sow stalls. So about one year after our resolution, in late 2011, we did the first survey of where the industry was. And where that pink area is at its highest, if you draw a line across from that to the vertical axis, you can see the proportions. But it's basically saying that even one year after the resolution, one third of the industry's sows were meeting the definition of the phase out. So they were gestation stall free. We did the same survey a year later, so two years after the resolution, more than 50% of the industry's sows uh, were found to be sow stall free. For our full industry resolution to be met, the totality of this chart needs to be green by 2017. So it's just over three years now since we made our voluntary commitment. And we are in the final stages of doing another survey to see where the industry is. But we know already, before we finalise the survey, that we can measure and we can name the properties where more than 60% of our national production is meeting the sow stall phase out definition. And we forecast that by the time we finish this survey, it will show that more than two thirds of the industry is operating under the gestation stall free definition. And that's in line with our, our, def, our phase out definition. So we reckon that's fantastic progress. We're on the, the way to meet our full 2017 commitment. And that's despite the cost of the shift away from sow stalls costing our pig farmers around about $50 million in new infrastructure. And we've had some great supporters along the way. The Australian government has been a great supporter and, and given us much encouragement with this voluntary initiative. And I should mention also the RSPCA has worked with us to make sure that people understand as much as possible about what our industry has been achieving. Not everyone, however, has been so supportive in the industry shift away from sow stalls. And doing the right thing isn't always easy, and that might be one of the lessons to take away from this presentation. Since our industry has taken a public position on shifting away from sow stalls, We've suffered firstly the Make It Possible anti-factory farming campaign from Animals Australia, where they use celebrity ambassadors, people like Pat Rafter, Peter Siddle, Missy Higgins, to help, uh, help with their campaign. We've taken the trouble as an industry to write to every single one of the Animals Australia ambassadors, basically saying that we respect their right to have an opinion about how animals should be treated, that we think they would be better off forming opinion with hearing both sides of the story, and that we've got many positive things to say about what the Australian industry has been achieving. Uh, and then we would respect where their opinion lay after having a meeting with us, and we would offer to go anywhere to meet with them. And of all those letters that we've sent, we have not had one response. Secondly, Voiceless and other animals rights groups many months after we made our South Stall phase out commitment, seemingly in complete ignorance of it, launched an anti-industry document around why we should abolish South Stalls. And so they seem to be operating in some sort of campaign land, completely ignorant 
of what the industry was achieving on its own. And this lack of support from these sorts of bodies, or in fact, the, the undermining of the in industry's initiative to phase out sow stalls, uh, from these types of groups who claim to be interested in animal welfare has been personally very disappointing. And I think it's exposed these groups as welfare frauds, uh, where they're more interested in stopping animal farming than they are in improving animal welfare. Similarly, over the past 18 months, the pork industry, particularly in New South Wales, has been suffering from farm raids, where activists break in to our pig farms in the dead of night with their lights, their cameras, uh, looking for negative Im images to put up on their websites. And they're supported by another organisation, Animal Liberation, uh, both the ACT and New South Wales chapters. So these groups don't want to listen to the real facts about what's happening in Australian pig production, and the reality is that no matter what the pork industry does, these groups will never have anything positive to say about us. On top of these activities, um, we are also unfortunately under investigation from the ACCC around the use of the terminology sow stall free. And the basis for that is the, the ACCC has some concerns that some consumers may be unintentionally misled by the use of those terms because of those periods at the start and the end of pregnancy where there is still some uh, individual confinement, um, a maximum of 10%. And the consumers may not understand that that's not actually in a sow stall. So we're, uh, we're in discussions with the ACCC about how to manage that. And my presentation today has been adjusted so that I hope it would be in compliance with how they would like to see it. Uh, and in the last week or two, to top it all off, in a staggering act of futility, the ACT government has passed legislation to ban the use of sow stalls, despite there being no pig farms in the ACT, <laughs> and the fact that the industry is already most of the way in phasing them out anyway. And, and this has been done with zero consultation with the pork industry. So these people seem to be operating in, a, in some parallel universe where they're completely ignorant to what's happening around them. So we've had some great supporters along the way, uh, but it's no exaggeration to say that we've been surprised and disappointed at the response of some others to our South Store phase out initiative, especially when one considers that Australia continues to import thousands of tonnes of pork every week from countries where South Stores continue to be used. And clearly we have to not only continue to do the right thing as an industry, but we also have to get better at telling our story, not only about our, our welfare credentials, uh, but also about some other great things that we're, we're achieving. One of those being uh, reducing our carbon emissions. Around about 30% of all of the, the industry in Australia has either installed or is in the process of installing biogas energy generation systems. And you can see one in this photo. This is from a pig farm in Young. And in the past, they used to have a very substantial bill every month from the electricity company. And today, they get a check from that same electricity company every month. And that's because they've started capturing the gas, the methane, off their effluent ponds, which they clean, run through generators, power their farm from the electricity from those generators, and they have some surplus that they put back into the grid and get paid for. So it's a fantastic way of lowering their costs and it's also a fantastic way of lowering their emissions. We also have to keep telling people, of course, about the positive attributes of our product, like its low levels of fat. And I can't get the video to start. Here we go. Uh, which it's already started by the look of it. Just bear with me. Did you know that pork fillets have less than half the fat of beef fillets, less fat than snapper fillets, and are leaner than skinless chicken breast fillets? They're also a valuable source of iron, so get some pork on your fork. And we also have to keep, uh, keep telling people how we manage the expectations of our consumers around the different types of products that we have and the quality systems. Uh, we have an industry quality assurance system called APIC. Around about 90% of all of the pork industry's production fits under the APIC scheme. 
uh, either as just straight quality assured or we also have standards, production standards which support product claims out in the market. And these are very uh, strictly assessed and certified standards for free range, for outdoor bread and also for our own gestation store free standard. So we understand that the community and the consumer will ultimately decide the success or otherwise of our industry and our challenge is to ensure that they have a strong basis for making the right decision about that success. So thank you for giving me your time this afternoon to tell a little bit of the Australian pork industry story.